put this on my YouTube channel. All right, well, welcome. And uh, this is basically our fifth week already out of the eight weeks of the Biostatistics 2. And uh, tonight we're going to cover logistic regression. So I think you already have um, a good idea of what linear regression is. And basically regression is coming from general linear modeling or GLM, which is the umbrella concept, which is the parent of all the statistical concepts when it comes to ANOVA, when it comes to correlation, when it comes to t-test, when it comes to regression, there's only one parent concept and that is your GLM, general linear um, modeling. And what we learn is that as the independent variable increases, we also tend to see that the dependent variable also increases. So there is that linear um, behavior of our observations of the phenomenon of interest. So what's unique about logistic regression is that it is a very special type of regression where you're able to predict the outcome for as long as the outcome is a binary. So this is the only regression that you cannot forget. This is a regression where the outcome, so the dependent variable or the outcome is binary. What does that mean binary? Well, binary means it can only be either yes or no, or it can be two outcomes only basically. Yes, no, uh, affirmative, positive, and think of other outcomes that are, um, you know, got the disease, did not get the disease. Uh, pass the exam, did not pass the exam. So these are very important um, statistical modeling because it is so, it is so powerful that you can plug in your independent variable, which are your predictor variable. So these are your variables that's supposed to predict the outcome. So your independent variable are your predictor variable. And then your dependent variable is your outcome variable. And what's unique about logistic regression is that it has a binary outcome. So. I've used this. Um, well, we try to analyze our data at DePaul University, and um, we try to understand what are the independent variable or the predictive variable that we can use in our admissions as we select the applicants. Because we always get like around 75 applications every year, and we only have 25 spots that we can give every year to our students. So can you imagine sifting through 75 applications every year and who are you going to choose who are the lucky 25 that you're going to choose and you have to make sure that you're not going to make a mistake that these 25 students are really the creme de la creme and that they will be the best you know nurse anesthetist in your program and that they will definitely pass the board exam one time first pass rate so this is what logistic regression is really very powerful because you can plug in your independent variable. We try to look at the GPA of all the science courses. We try to look at their GRE scores in the mathematical section. And then we try to look at their nursing courses because our nurse anesthetists, they need to be a nurse and they need to be in the ICU for two years before they get admitted to the nurse anesthetist program in the doctoral program. So we look at their transcripts in the School of Nursing and we said, why don't we just select all of the nursing courses, the med surge one, med surge two, critical CCU, and then the maternal and child nursing, the fundamentals of nursing. So all the nursing courses only and get the GPA of those and see if that's a good predictor for first time pass rates in the national uh, certification exam for nurse anesthetists. So that's the intro to this. This is the beauty about logistic regression is that it only has, and it will only work if your outcome is binary. Binary means two possible results only. It can only be yes or no, it can be pass or fail, 
It can be, um, you know, success or no success. Um, things that are just basically, there's only two ways it can go into that direction. So that's what logistic regression is all about. So that is the answer to the question, what is logistic regression? This is a technique that we can use to obtain the adjusted odds ratio. So here we go again. You may have to recall what is odds ratios. Remember in epidemiology, odds ratios, the OR. So this was based on our lecture on statistics one. And this is an important concept in logistic regression because we are trying to model the outcome. And in order for us to model an outcome, to predict the outcome that's a binary outcome, we need to be able to say, what are the odds of this independent variable to become the predictor for a binary outcome? So it allows us this very special type of regression, this logistic regression, it allows us to build a model that examines the effect of several independent variables. And that's the beauty about this. You, you're not limited to only like simple linear regression. Remember that simple linear regression, we have one independent variable and one, one dependent variable. And basically you can regress and you can do also correlation coefficient and you'll get the same results, correct? So this is that's why I ask you to review a few of the slides uh, that, that examines the relationship of independent variables with the dependent variable. Now in logistic regression, remember again that your dependent variable is binary. And in other regressions, remember that your dependent variable is basically a phenomenon that are considered as interval data, um, ratio type of data that, you know, you can basically um, regress and see how much of the increment in the independent variable could potentially predict the degree of increment also in the dependent variable. Now here in logistic regression, you can have several independent variables, as I mentioned with the example that I've given you in a paper that will be published next year. And, uh, for It will be published in the AANA paper, the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists. Um, the editor really loved it because we were trying to model at least four independent variables. We tried to look at the science um, grade, the science GPA, the GRE score in the mathematics section, the nursing, um, the nursing courses uh, GPA in their BSN program. And also the fourth model that we're trying to build was their, um, their interviewing skills, especially what we call the, um, the mindfulness. Because basically when you're anesthetist, when you are a nurse anesthetist, you have to have awareness of your environment, awareness on your right, awareness on your left, awareness in your back, awareness in your front, because you're giving anesthetics and you can kill your patient in just two seconds. So based on that, logistic regression is so beautiful because what you can examine is that how much of these independent variables can be accounted for in your model to really have a very high predictive power of a binary outcome, which can only be yes or no, pass or fail, success or not success. So, Logistic regression is very popular among researchers. It is a very popular um, type of regression among PhD science, nurse scientists because again, of the simplicity of the modeling. There are other types of logistic regression that will allow you to have more than two categories in the dependent variable and those are what we call multivariate regression which is definitely a whole different level of regression. Now, continuing on the concepts of logistic regression, by obtaining the adjusted odd ratios of our independent variable with 
specific way of controlling the unique effect of the presence of other independent variable, we can build a model that is considered as parsimonious. So here in logistic regress regression, parsimony is very important. And parsimonious means basically the most simplistic model that we can describe and realistically predict the binary dependent variable. So when we think about logistic regression, sometimes it could be that two independent variable in your model is the best representation for your data set. And that's what you call the best fit model. And that is what you call the most parsimonious model. By using and by examining modeling technique where you're going to ask yourself, how does the model looks like if I will only use the science GPA and the nursing courses GPA to predict the first time 100 pass rate of my 25 students every year. So should the two independent variable considered as the best fit or are there still other variables, a third or a fourth variable that will give you a higher predictive power in making sure that you have a very good predictive ability for your binary outcome, which is obviously one of those binary outcome is 100% pass rate. So it can answer the question, 100% pass rate or less than 100, because it can only go two ways. It's always binary outcome when it comes to logistic regression. So in our experience with, when we examine all the admission uh, data from our applicants, we actually use four years of data, year after year after year after year. And then we model those year after year after year and then we look at the most parsimonious model that can definitely give us the best fit that would represent the reality, what is actually happening. So when we look at logistic regression, what we are trying to really build is a very accurate model. Uh, think about another example for this is like when you predict the weather, you know, when you have to predict, you know, the typhoon, what's gonna be the what's gonna be the strength of the typhoon? Remember that those uh, meteorologists they have to use the humidity, they have to use the 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 temperature of the ocean, they have to also measure the the pressure, the barometer, barometric pressure, and then they also have to use how much, how moist are the air and how much of that conglomeration of the hot and the cold air that can funnel the whole um, eye of the storm and then can lead to higher speed of the wind and the directions and how far it should spin to the right, whether it's going to spin to the east or it's going to spin to the west, which is very important when we try to predict because we want to warn people to evacuate, right? If we're saying, okay, the, the typhoon is heading, is heading to Bohol, but actually it's heading down to Surigao del Sur, that's a nightmare. Your model is so wrong. So it's really important to know that when you are trying to meet, uh, when you're trying to model your data, your data needs to have the best representation of what's going to happen. So that's another way of looking at modeling of your data. And in this logistic regression, what I really like about logistic regression is the fact that it is parsimonious. And I really like the idea that it will just simply answer the question, yes or no. So 
So what is model building? I think I've already alluded to this uh, earlier that a model is a simplified representation of the reality. So your data set is already after the fact, right? You already have the data. So for example, for us at DePaul, we already have our four year data. We have data from the 2018 admissions, 2019 admissions, 2020 admissions to 2021 admissions. So we have four year data. We have all the data of the science GPA. We have all the data of their nursing courses GPA. We have all the data of the GRA for their mathematics section. And then we also have the data based on the, um, you know, mindfulness and situational awareness scoring that we did when we tried to interview them. So based on that, and we also have our pass rates for our students. And, you know, based on what we have, we have a pass rate of 87%, we have a pass rate of 92%, we have a pass rate of 99%, and then we have a pass rate of 100%. So as you combine this four year of data, you are going to be able to create a model that's parsimonious. And the beauty about logistic regression is that it will definitely tell you whether a three independent variable um, model is better than a four independent variable model than a two independent variable model. So that's the beauty about um, model building is that you start to examine how does your prediction, predictive power, how accurate does it become to represent the reality? As you examine your model, I'm only gonna use two out of the four independent variables. This is how it looks like. It's not very good. It doesn't account. It can only account about 80% of the variances. Now, you try to say, all right, let's combine the, this three independent variable and see what happens. And then again, you will examine how well does that model predict or explain your outcome, which is your percent, passing percentage for your national uh, certification exam for nurse anesthetist. So, so if you are a dean in the School of Nursing, at Cebu Doctors. And of course, you have your data. Uh, I remember, my God, at the time with Dr. with Madame Cisno, that you know, we look at the Revalida and then we tell our students, if you don't have this score uh, in the Revalida, do not take the exam because you're not going to pass the National uh, Nurses Board exam. And it was very, very predictive. The revalida one independent variable basically tells you that if you have the scores in your revalida, you will be able to pass the national board exam at first time uh, attempt. So anyway, that's the concept for this. When it comes to logistic regression, it is the statistics that you're going to use. If you are going to examine how well you can predict the student's outcome when, when they are about to take their national uh, nurses board exam. So I think Madame Cisno had that wisdom that she, she, always, she always makes us, as, as a faculty member, I always remember, she will always, always make us calculate the mean, the median, and then the standard deviation. And then she would always make that difficult decision of where is gonna be the cutoff, which is your standard, standardized pass rate. This is where we're going to stop. And then we have to tell the students they failed and therefore they will be behind for one year uh, among their peers. So it's very important that when you become a dean, and you will be because like PhD will be good. So what's the whole point of getting a PhD when eventually you become a dean? Uh, you're ahead of your peers. Ang mga peers, poor sila master's prepared. And there are six of you here in this class, and you are going to be PhD prepared. I will be surprised if 10 years from now, you will not become the dean. 
Sugot rin na ikaw nga, ang imong dean, master's paper niya, ikaw may PhD niya. Dili na noon ikaw may dean. So, I will definitely catch up with all of you and hopefully, um, you know, you will use your knowledge and statistics as you become the dean, you do need to pay attention to your statistics. You need to be more um, discerning and you need to be more uh, uh, you need to be more investigative, I think would be the right word when it comes to looking at your success rates. And try to really look at your pass rates, try to look at your predictors for your pass rates for the national board exam, and also try to look at your predictor for success in finishing your Bachelor of Science of Nursing uh, program. Because we know that you know attrition is always bad for the school. You always want all the people that you accepted to your Bachelor of Science of Nursing program should have a 100% graduation rate. So how do you keep up with 100% graduation rate? Well, if you become the dean, you pay attention. How much is the cutoff in their, in their science courses in high school? How much is their not? Are you gonna use the average of all the courses? Are you gonna you just use the average of the science and math? All of this, eventually will become your independent variable for your logistic regression. So, so here's the concept of logistic regression. As I've mentioned, we're going to use the ads ratios. And the ads ratios, we covered this in the epidemiological um, statistics. It is simply the probability of occurrence over the probability of non occurrence. So occurred, did not occur. So presence divided by the absence. Now the ads ratio, so, that was the odds, sorry. The odds is the probability of occurrence over the probability of the non-occurrence. Now, once we talk about ratio, you have to have two things, right? Because how can you create a ratio when there's only one? So always remember ratio indicates that you have a comparison. So the odds ratio is now the odds of the outcome in one group that are exposed. And then you divide, it, you divide that number with the odds in another group that is obviously not exposed. So then once you have those, the odds ratio of greater than one simply means that those in the exposed group have a higher risk of the occurrence of the outcome than those in the non-exposed group. Now, this is very simple. When you read this, it's so easy, but then the math is not that simple because it just doesn't, you have to remember you have to calculate the odds first. Once you already have the odds, then you have to calculate the odds ratio. And once you have the odds ratio, then you have to do an analysis of the odds ratio of the exposed and the odds ratio of the non-exposed in order to really get the odds ratios. So. What about the risk ratios? Well, risk is basically the probability of getting an outcome and can only be calculated with a data from a longitudinal study. Now we can use the risk ratio when it comes to looking at the probability of getting an outcome in one group divided by the probability of getting the outcome in the other group. Now that's what you call the risk ratio. Now. There's another term called the relative risk, which is a term that we use interchangeably when it comes to risk ratio or odds ratio. So when you see publications that talk about relative risk, just remember that is also likely an odds ratio or a risk ratio. Now, the reason why we review risk ratio, odds ratios, and um, relative risk in, in logistic regression is that this is the fundamental mathematical calculation for determining how much would an independent variable would account for 
for the variances that we can observe in our model as we build our model into a two independent variable model, a three independent variable model, or a four independent variable model that can predict our binary outcome, which can only be yes, no, success, no success, fail or pass. So an illustration here of our odds ratio and our relative, um, relative uh, risk or our risk ratio is basically an example from you know a 3055 pregnant women that we collected data on maternal smoking and the incidence of birth weight of low birth weight of the infant at birth so here on your left side in the left column you will see smoking no and then the second um category is smoking yes and then in your uh, in your row so making sure row for low birth weight you also have the incidence of no low birth weight or the incidence of yes low birth weight and what that tells you basically is that when you try to calculate for the odds what you are trying to basically think of what is the odds for low birth weight among the non-smokers? So the answer would be 76, which is you have 76 divided by 746 divided by 670, which is your low birth weight for Incidence of no low birth weight for those who are smokers divided by the total number of low birth weight, which is 746. Now that's the odds. So basically you will have a 0.10 divided by 0.90 and the odds is 0.11. That is just the odds. We're not just, we're not there yet with the odds ratio. So what is the so that's the odds for the uh, this is for the exposed because we are talking about the yes of um, smoking and the yes for low birth weight 76 divided by 746 and then 670 divided by 746 so that is the that is just the odds of low birth weight among the smokers. Now, what is the odds for low birth weight among the non-smokers? So you just basically 144 divided by 2,339 divided by 2,165, which is the number of no low birth weight among the non-smokers divided by 2,309. And so the odds for so the odds for the non-exposed is 0 0.06. The odds for the exposed is 0 0.11. Obviously it's higher for those who are exposed, right? Now we need to calculate the risk by doing 144 divided by 2309. The risk is only 0 0.06. When it comes to the risk for the non-exposed, you have 76 divided by 746 and you have 0.1. I'm sorry, this is the exposed. The 144 divided by 2,309 is for the non-exposed because there's no smoking. And then for the exposed, for the risk for the exposed, which is the smokers, yes, is 0 0.10. Once you have your odds and once you have your risk, then you can calculate your odds ratios and your risk ratios. So here we go. So in order for us to calculate the odds ratio, basically is we just need to calculate, we obtain 0.11, which is your exposed divided by the non-exposed. And that is what we call the occurred divided by the non-occurrence. And so the odds ratio for this particular group of 3,055 pregnant women is 1.83. So basically what that tells you that uh, it's about 
1.8 times more uh, odds that a pregnant woman who smokes will have a low birth weight infant. When, what about the relative risk? Well, the relative risk, we simply divide the 0.1 with the 0 0.06. So again, that is the risk for those who are exposed divided by the non-exposed. And then we have a 1.67 relative risk of having a low birth weight if you are smoking during your pregnancy period. And here, the odds ratio is slightly larger than the relative risk. That's because the outcome is very much commonly observed. So what type of research question can we ask for logistic regression? Well, let's say we're interested in knowing if people who are trying to lose weight are less likely to go out to eat a lot. And then you need to define, so what's, this is what you call the operational definition of terms in research. So what does going, going out to eat a lot means? It says more than five times per week than those who are not dieting. So we also know that gender is related to both going out to eat at restaurants and seeking to lose weight. So the question is, how can we tell if dieting affects the odds of going out to eat a lot, which is more than five times per week, while controlling for the gender, whether you're a man or a woman? So we will use the following question to illustrate logistic regression. Because remember, logistic regression can only have a binary outcome. So. The question is, what is the effect of going out to eat frequently on trying to lose weight once the gender is controlled for? Now, our dependent variable, which is, has to be binary, is frequency of going out to eat that's less than five times per week versus five or more times per week. Now, our independent variable one would be gender, male or female. Our independent variable two is trying to lose weight in the past year, which is yes or no. And this is a di dichotomous independent variable. And that's the beauty about logistic regression. Your independent variable can be dichotomous and you also have a very simplistic outcome that you're trying to answer, which is a binary outcome, which is either at least, we either say yes, less than five times per week, or no, which is five or more times per week. So the type of data of their assumption. Now, the dependent variable is dichotomous. You only have two categories, five times per week or more or less than five times per week. Now, in order for us to interpret the result, this is a very important concept when we try to set up our SPSS and, and when we try to use logistic regression, we need to create a dummy variable. So when I was still in my PhD program, this is one thing that I tried to forget is to create a dummy variable. Now you cannot forget, logistic regression must have a dummy variable. The reason for that is that if you don't create a dummy variable, then you have no point of reference. So in order for us to interpret the result of logistic regression in a meaningful way, we must have a dummy variable. So how do we do dummy variables? Well, it is good practice to code your dichotomous variables as zero or one, where zero indicates the absence and one indicates the presence of the condition, right? So that it's easy to remember. Zero means negative, one is positive, because at least one is, is, is a number, you know? It's a positive number. So 
Now, when we use the dummy variable to express a nominal variable with multiple categories by a series of dichotomous variables that compare one category to a different category, that is the essence of a reference variable, okay? That is why we need to create dummy variables. Without a dummy variable, we will not be able to interpret the result of the logistic regression because we have no point of comparison. We have no beginning. We need to have a beginning where we can say, if, you know, if, if one belongs to zero, then that is not considered as a measurable differentiator for other independent variables. So one of the categories is chosen to serve as your reference category. And then once we have our dummy variables, then we can start regressing and creating our model based on the original categorical variable. And I will demonstrate this to you. So let's say we have race and ethnicity variable with four categories, non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black, non-Hispanic Asian, and Hispanic. Now, if we want to use it in a logistic regression, we would need to create three variables to represent the four categories. Why? Because we need to have a reference to compare the other three. So if you have four categories, you need to create one of the four has to be a dummy variable. So we would put these variables into logistic regression equation instead of the four categorical race ethnicity variable. So look at this. We would therefore create four minus one and that equals three dummy variables and choose one category. In this case, non-Hispanic white as the reference. So that non-Hispanic black would be one is yes, zero is no. And non-Hispanic Asian, one would be yes and zero would be no. And a Hispanic, one would be yes and zero would be no. Remember, you always need to have a dichotomous variable here. Note that if we know the value of these three variables for a given study participants, then we can deduce his or her race ethnicity as the independent variable that can account for the variance that lead to the outcome variable. So his, here's how do we fit this into a logistic regression modeling? Well, the logistic fits a shape referred to as the line. And we are again using this method called maximum likelihood estimation near MLE. And the dependent variable is transformed using a log logic transformation. Now, this is a very important uh, mathematical calculation in logistic regression is we do use logistic transformation, logic. So um, for those of you, you need to recall this from your geometry and for, your, and for our uh, algebra. We need the, the mathematical calculations in a logistic regression is that there is a logic transformation that's happening. And then the coefficient or what we call the betas, which is considered as the intercept of the slope in a multivariate logistic regression is the representation of the log or, so, or what we call the logarithm of the adjusted odds ratio for each of the dependent variable. Now to obtain the adjusted odds ratios and obtain the confidence interval, this is now the mathematical calculations that SPSs will do for you. Each of the beta coefficient is exponentiated because E to the beta or what we call an exponentiated beta coefficient is basically the anti-log of your logistic transformation. So I know this is probably uh, going to require you to just review your algebra, but remember that when you transform your dependent binary variable into a logic transformation, 
when that is also being used in a model, what it does is that it will create an exponentiated beta coefficient, which is represented by your e to the b to the beta. And basically what that means is that that is the anti-log of your logit transformation of your dependent variable. SPSS will do this for us. We don't have to do this hand calculation of you know, logit transformation and then calculating the anti-log of the exponentiated beta coefficient. Luckily, we have powerful computers now. We don't have to do this by hand. So the information from the logistic regression model, it will give us the minus two LL test. That is the statistical significance of the overall model. And remember, we always set our statistical significance at a 0.05 level of significance, which allows us only a 5% chance of probability that what we get is by chance. Now, the overall fit of the model and the data is going to be uh, represented by your Hosmer limb show goodness of fit test statistics. And then your Cox and Snail R squared and your Nagel Kirk R squared are the rough estimate. They are the rough estimate of the overall amount of variation in the dependent variable explained by all of the independent variable, whether you have two independent variables, whether you have three independent variables, or whether you have four independent variables. But again, the maximum likelihood estimation will give us the most parsimonious model of our logistic regression. Now, the strength and direction of the association of each independent variable with the dependent variable using your adjusted beta and your adjusted odds ratio that remember, there is a logic transformation happening at the same time, the beta coefficients will be the anti-log of, of, um, of your independent variable um, contribution to the entire model. So the statistical significance of the association of each independent variable with the dependent variables are basically going to be your confidence interval around your odds ratios and your p-values because your p-values is always determined based on your level of significance that you set at a 0.05 level. Now, this is a very, very large study. It's called the 489 New York chain study. This is a study with that look at the association of eating out in restaurants often five times or greater per week on average for those who are trying to lose weight. So the dependent variable is you have to code restaurant dichotomous coded as eating out five times per week on average is one. Eating out less than five times a week is coded as zero. Because remember, you need to have one has to be always your sort of like that is your outcome. And then the zero, that is your negative. That's the opposite of what you're trying to predict. Now, your independent variable is, are they losing weight? The, this will be coded as for those who are trying to lose weight in the past year, they will be coded as one. For those who did not try to lose weight in the past year, they will be coded as zero because as what you know, the earlier slide set um, showed us, we always need to code it as one zero one zero and always try to remember, be consistent with your coding, um, that one should be the one that is has an impact and zero is the one that has no impact or the one that you can always associate as doing nothing, basically. So. Now for the gender here, well, this one, it's up to you. Just be careful whether when you code female that you remember that the female is one and that the male is zero. Here, there's no right or wrong coding. You can actually code your male as one or you can code your female as um, zero. But here, 
Just remember, it's important to know how did you code your variable when it comes to one and zero, because when you interpret the results, you need to be able to say exactly which group has or doesn't have the outcome variable. So here, the hypothesis that we will test that, of course, the null hypothesis will be stated as attempting to lose weight in the past year will not affect the odds of going out to eat frequently, adjusting for gender. And of course, our adjusted beta is zero and our adjusted odds ratio is equal to one because anything higher than one, that means that is a higher odds ratio. And that is towards you know, the opposite hypothesis, which is the alternative hypothesis here is that attempting to lose weight in the past year will affect the odds of going out to eat frequently, that is five times or more per week, adjusting for gender. And here in your alternative hypothesis, your adjusted beta is not equal to zero and your adjusted odds ratio is not equal to one because this is your alternative hypothesis. Then we set the statistical significance at the 0.05 level. So our model significance will be determined by the minus two of the log likelihood. So that's represented by minus two LL. So LL means the log, log that's the log, logit transformation likelihood. And, it, and this statist statistics compares the likelihood of the alternate model with all the independent variables you included in this uh, particular example, remember, it's the gender and the going out and that of the null model where there are no variables included. So remember our null model says attempting to lose weight in the past year will not affect the odds of going, to, going out to eat frequently, which is your five times per week or more. So this is how it's going to look like on SPSS. So the minus two LL for the null model is 516.86. And that is stated in the iteration history in the left-hand corner. You will see the 516.860. But look at the iteration at step one. Iteration step zero, and then one, two, three, and four. If you look at the minus two logis, logistic transformation likelihood, you can see that it starts with 518.49, then 516.86, then 516.86, and then 516.86. So that basically tells you that the first, the first log likelihood is not the right model because you are getting even in another parsimonious uh, outcome of 516.861. And then here on the third iteration history, you have 516.860, which is just a hair lower than the second iteration, which is 516.861. And if you look at the co your coefficient, which is your beta coefficients, and that's your considered as your constant. By the way, in SPSS, constant is representative of the intercept of your linear regression model. So if you look at there, you will, you will see that the coefficient value of your constant or what we call the intercept is minus 1.101, minus 1.233, minus 1.238, and then the fourth is still the same, minus 1.238. So once you reach a repetition where your initial minus two log likelihood is 516.860 is already repeated, then that represents your best model of your data. And then the model summary in the right-hand corner will show you that the 
minus the logistic likelihood of 491.336 has a Cox and Snell R squared of 0 0.051, and it has a Nagel Kirk R squared of 0 0.078. Continuing on the output in SPSS, you will also see the omnibus test of model coefficients table that gives the square statistics and shows you the difference between the minus log likelihood of the null model and the final model. Remember the step four of the iteration, the 491.34 minus 516.86 is equal to 25.53. Now there are three chi-squares, one for step, one for block, and one for model. The variables were entered together, so the values of the three are the same. Remember that what I've said that the logistic transformation will be represented by the beta coefficients with the anti-log of your beta coefficients. And so here in the omnibus test of model coefficient, you will see that the step, step one for step is 25.524. The step one for block is 25.524. And the step one for model is also 25. 54 with a degree of freedom of two because we have three levels basically so three minus one it's always n minus one and so we have a degree of freedom of two and our statistical significance is 0 0.000 and we want this to be statistically significant because this will tell us that this is the right model for our logistic regression now, what about the Hosmer and Lim show test statistics? Well, this is your goodness of fit statistics. And you always want this statistics to be non-significant because a non-significant results will indicate that the model fits the data. So you can see here that for step one with a chi-square of 0.358 with a degree of freedom of two, that significant value is 0.836. So that is higher than the 0.05. And we always want our Hosmer and Lim show test to be higher than the 0.05 level because when it is a non-significant result, it indicates that our model is the right model. Okay. Now, this is now the approximate variation that can be explained by our model. And we have to look at the summary table and pay attention more on the Cox and Snail and the Nagel Kirk R squared. Because the Nagel Kirk R squared and the Cox and Snail R squared are the proportion of the statistics where the variance can be explained. And what our model is showing is that the variance that can be explained so far is basically 5.1% to 7.8%. Now, where did we get that model summary? Well, according to the SPSS output, when you have a minus two log likelihood of 499, a 491.300, 0.336, your Cox and Snail R squared is about 0.051, and your Nagel Kirk R squared is 0.078. What that means is that you basically just uh, you just basically take your Cox and Snail R squared as your low. Uh, that's the lower. Um, that's the lower end of your variance explanation. And then your Nagel Kirk R squared is the higher end of your variance um, explanation for your model. So from the regression itself, what we can conclude is that 
what we have is that the odds ratios for the model where the y is the probability of eating out five times per week and our beta for losing weight is about minus 0 0.030 and for the gender these are our independent variable which is minus 1.11 we have the regression constant, which is our intercept value of 0.644. Now, remember, we have to do the logistic transformation, the logit transformation. So the log of n is basically y divided by 1 minus y is equal to minus 0.644. We subtract that with what we have in our beta coefficient for losing weight, which is 0 0.030. And we also subtract our beta for the gender, which is minus 1.111. And then you'll be able to see that you have your beta. Losing weight is 0 0.030. The gender is one point. It's minus 1.111. And for your constant, which is your intercept, it's minus 0 0.644. You have your standard error, and then you have your wild statistics with a degree of freedom of one, and you will have your statistically significant result. And as you can see there, the exponentiated beta, which is your anti log. Remember that I, I, explain this that because you're doing your logic transformation when you have your beta coefficient it has to be exponentiated because it is the anti-log of your logic transformation and then your basically your 95 confidence interval for your exponentiated beta is there also stated for your independent variable lose weight and your independent variable gender and when you look at your lower and upper 95% conf confidence interval, you can basically see that what that means is that the adjusted odds ratio for losing weight, which is represented by your exponentiated beta of, point, of minus 0 0.030 is equal to 0 0.970. And the significance is 0.896. So what does that tell you? Losing weight, those who intend to lose weight, it's not statistically significant. But what about the gender? Well, it looks like for the gender, the odds ratio, we have an exponentiated beta of minus 1.111. And the, the statistics value for that is 0.329 with a, with a significance of 0 0.000. So that is less than 0 0.05. So we know then that our model, we can account gender. It is statistically significant. However, we cannot account their intention to lose weight in one year. So when we then state our conclusion, we will say then, that trying to lose weight does not significantly affect the odds of frequently going out to eat because it was not statistically significant. Remember the result is, the significance is 0.896. So therefore, when we make our conclusion, we have to state that trying to lose weight does not significantly affect the odds of frequently going out to eat when controlling for gender, however, because we have a statistically significant result for the gender, we have a significance level of 0 0.0000. We can then say that women are significantly less likely to go out to eat frequently with an odds ratio of 0 0.329 than are men. Because how did we know this? Well, we coded we coded our female as one and our male is zero. And therefore, when you have an odds ratio of 0 0.329, you are referring to women who are significantly less likely to go out to eat frequently. 
Can you imagine if you don't remember how you coded your women and women was one and men was zero? Now, if it would have been coded the reverse way, then you will have to be very careful on how you state your conclusion. So in summary, logistic regression can be used when the outcome of interest is dichotomous or binary. The independent variables can be on any scale. That's the beauty about logistic regression. You can have categorical, you can have a ratio, you can have an interval, a type of data, a polytomous independent variable. That's the beauty about logistic regression. Your independent variable can take into so many forms, but you have to create a dummy variable though, especially for categorical because you will have no reference. The most useful result from a logistic regression is always the adjusted odds ratios. And remember that the adjusted odds ratios is calculated based on logit transformation, exponentiated beta, which is represented by an anti-log representation of your beta coefficients. And the regression output then gives us the information about the regression diagnostics the overall significance, the goodness of fit, which is our Hosmer and limb show statistic. And then, of course, the range of the variance is calculated by the Negerkirk and also the Coxon snail uh, R squared. That's the end of, of the presentation. I hope that uh, you'll be able to use this uh, in one of your future projects. Um, again, this is very powerful when you're trying to predict those who pass or will, who will fail your, the national board exam, those who will pass or uh, those who will complete or those who will graduate or not graduate in a BSN program. And then you try to examine, you know, what are those independent predictor variables that you're going to see? Is it the general average? Is it, you know, the um, just the science and the math uh, grade of, of, you know, on their senior year? Or is it the junior and the senior year? Because when you have two years of record, probably that is more predictive and it's more stable. It's just, you know, and it may account for some of those challenges that a student may have in a given year and there's some kind of correction. So again, statistics is, is really very powerful, but you do need to make sure that you try to account for all the possibilities. And what we're trying to do in statistics is always modeling. We model, we model, we model, and we look at the best model that can represent the reality so that we can learn from that reality and then we can be more selective, we can be more discerning, and we can be more deliberative in our decisions. All right, so that's the summary of this uh, logistic regression lecture, and I hope to see you next week for another very interesting statistics, which is factor analysis where we are going to be able to learn the effect of latent variable. So latent means those variables that we didn't even think existed. But once we do our factor analysis, then we have to use our brains. We have to use our experience. We have to use our expertise in order to determine what is this latent variable that the data is telling us. All right, have a good night or good morning to all of you and I'll see you next week. Any questions, by the way? None so far though. <laughs> And so far, Doc, thank you. All right. Well, there are more video lectures. Thank you, Doc. I can also post this in the YouTube so you can, again, as soon as you hear this more and more, it will get better. It's the same thing when I did my PhD. When I was listening to the professor, I was like, oh my God, what is this professor talking about? I was like, everything was Greek to me. But then as soon as I just keep on you know, listening and listening and listening, it actually makes sense. And then, of course, a little review of algebra. 
making sure you, you try to review those logit transformation, anti-log, you know, it will help in trying to sort of like make sense of them all. All right, take care and see you next week. Thank you, Dr. Rima. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Care. Dr. All right, bye-bye.